magical passes, the practical wisdom of the shamans of ancient Mexico. Introduction Don Juan Matis, a master sorcerer, a Nahual, as master sorcerers are called when they lead a group of other sorcerers, introduced me to the cognitive world of shamans who lived in Mexico in ancient times. Don Juan Matis was an Indian who was born in Yuma, Arizona. His father was a Yaqui Indian from Sonora, Mexico, and his mother was presumably a Yuma Indian from Arizona. Don Juan lived in Arizona until he was 10 years old. He was then taken by his father to Sonora, Mexico, where they were caught in the endemic Yaqui Wars against the Mexicans. His father was killed, and as a 10-year-old child, Don Juan ended up in southern Mexico, where he grew up with relatives. At the age of 20, he came in contact with the master sorcerer. His name was Julian Osario. He introduced Don Juan into a lineage of sorcerers that was purported to be 25 generations long. He was not an Indian at all, but the son of a European of European immigrants to Mexico. Don Juan related to me that the Nahual Julian had been an actor and that he was a dashing person, a raconteer, a mime, adored by everybody, influential, commanding. In one of his theatrical tours to the provinces, the actor Julian Osario fell under the influence of another Nawal, Elias Uloa, who transmitted to him the knowledge of his lineage of sorcerers. Don Juan Matas, following the tradition of his lineage of shamans, taught some bodily movements which he called magical passes to his four disciples, Taisha Abelar, Florinda Donna Grau, Carol Tiggs, and myself. He taught them to us in the same spirit in which they had been taught for generation, generations, with one notable departure. He eliminated the excessive ritual which had surrounded the teaching and performance of those magical passes for generations. Don Juan's comments in this respect were that ritual had lost its impetus as new generations of practitioners became more interested in efficiency and functionalism. He recommended to me, however, that under no circumstances should I talk about the magical passes with any of his disciples or with people in general. His reasons were that the magical passes pertained exclusively to each person and that their effect was so shattering it was better just to practice them without discussing them. Don Juan Matas taught me everything he knew about the sorcerers of his lineage. He stated, asserted, affirmed, explained to me every nuance of his knowledge. Therefore, everything I say about the magical passes is a direct result of his instruction. The magical passes were not invented. They were discovered by the shamans of Don Juan's lineage, who lived in Mexico in ancient times, while they were in shamanistic states of heightened awareness. The discovery of the magical passes was quite accidental. It began as very simple queries about the nature of an incredible sensation of well-being that those shamans experienced in those states of heightened awareness when they held certain bodily positions or when they moved their limbs in some specific manner. 
Their sensation of well-being had been so intense that their drive to repeat those movements in their normal awareness became the focus of all their endeavors. By all appearances, they succeeded in their task and found themselves the possessors of a very complex series of movements that, when practiced, yielded them tremendous results in terms of mental and physical prowess. In fact, the results of performing these movements were so dramatic that they called them magical passes. They taught them for generations only to shaman initiates on a personal basis, following elaborate rituals and secret ceremonies. Don Juan Matas, in teaching the magical passes, departed radically from tradition. Such a departure forced Don Juan to reformulate the pragmatic goal of the magical passes. He presented this goal to me not so much as the enhancement of mental and physical balance as it had been in the past, but as the practical possibility of redeploying energy. He explained that such a departure was due to the influence of the two Nawals who had preceded him. It was the belief of the sorcerers of Don Juan's lineage that there is an inherent amount of energy existing in each one of us, an amount which is not subject to the onslaughts of outside forces for augmenting it or for decreasing it. They believed that this quantity of energy was sufficient to accomplish something which those sorcerers deemed to be obsession of every man on earth, breaking the parameters of normal perception. Don Juan Matis was convinced that our incapacity to break those parameters was induced by our culture and social milieu. He maintained that our culture and social milieu deployed every bit of our inherent energy in fulfilling established behavioral patterns which didn't allow us to break those parameters of normal perception. Why in the world would I or anyone else want to break those parameters? I asked Don Juan on one occasion. Breaking those parameters is the unavoidable issue of mankind, he replied. Breaking them means the entrance into unthinkable worlds of a pragmatic value in no way different from the value of our world of everyday life. Regardless of whether or not we accept this premise, we are obsessed with breaking those parameters and we fail miserably at it. Hence, the profusion of drugs and stimulants and religious rituals and ceremonies among modern man. Why do you think we have failed so miserably, Don Juan? I asked. Our failure to fulfill our subliminal wish, he said, is due to the fact that we tackle it in a helter-skelter way. Our tools are too crude. They are equivalent to trying to bring down a wall by ramming it with the head. Man never considers this breakage in terms of energy. For sorcerers, success is determined only by the accessibility or the inaccessibility of energy. Since it is impossible, he continued, to augment our inherent energy, the only avenue open for the sorcerers of ancient Mexico was the redeployment of that energy. For them, this process of redeployment began with the magical passes 
and the way they affected the physical body. Don Juan stressed in every possible way while imparting his instruction the fact that the enormous emphasis the shamans of his lineage had put on physical prowess and mental well-being had lasted to the present day. I was able to corroborate the truth of his statements by observing him and his 15 sorcerer companions. Their superb physical and mental balance was the most obvious feature about them. Don Juan's reply when I once asked him directly why sorcerers put so much stock in the physical side of man was a total surprise to me. I had always thought that he himself was a spiritual man. Shamans are not spiritual at all, he said. They are very practical beings. It is a well-known fact, however, that shamans are generally regarded as eccentric or even insane. Perhaps that is what makes you think that they are spiritual. They seem insane because they are always trying to explain things that cannot be explained. In the course of such futile attempts to give complete explanations that cannot be completed under any circumstances, they lose all coherence and say inanities. You need a pliable body if you want physical prowess and level-headedness, he went on. These are the two most important issues in the lives of shamans because they bring forth sobriety and pragmatism the only indispensable requisites for entering into other realms of perception. To navigate in a genuine way in the unknown necess necessitates an attitude of daring, but not one of recklessness. In order to establish a balance between audacity and recklessness, a sorcerer has to be extremely sober, cautious, skillful, and in superb physical condition. But why in superb physical condi condition, Don Juan? I asked. Isn't the desire or the will to journey into the unknown enough? Not in your pissy life, he replied rather brusquely. Just to conceive facing the unknown, much less enter into it, requires guts of steel and a body that would be capable of holding those guts. What would be the point of being gutsy if you didn't have mental alertness, physical prowess, and adequate muscles? The superb physical condition that Don Juan had steadily advocated from the first day of our association, the product of the rigorous ex execution of the magical passes was by all indications the first step toward the redeployment of our inherent energy. This redeployment of energy was, in Don Juan's view, the most crucial issue in the lives of shamans as well as in the life of any individual. Redeployment of energy is a process which consists of transporting from one place to another energy which already exists within us. This energy has been displaced from centers of vitality in the body which require that displaced energy in order to bring forth a balance between mental alertness and physical prowess. The shamans of Don Juan's lineage were deeply engaged with the redeployment of their inherent energy. 
this involvement wasn't an intellectual endeavor, nor was it the product of induction or deduction or logical conclusions. It was the result of their ability to perceive energy as it flowed in the universe. Those sorcerers called this ability to perceive energy as it flowed in the universe seen. Don Juan explained to me. They described seen as a state of heightened awareness in which the human body is capable of perceiving energy as a flow, a current, a wind-like vibration. To see energy as it flows in the universe is the product of a momentary halt of the system of interpretation proper to human beings. What is this system of interpretation, Don Juan? I asked. The shamans of ancient Mexico found out, he replied, that every part of the human body is engaged in one way or another, in turning this vibratory flow, this current of vibration, into some form of sensory input. The sum total of this bombardment of sensory input is then, through usage, turned into the system of interpretation that makes human beings capable of perceiving the world the way they do. To make this system of interpretation come to a halt, he went on, was the result of tremendous discipline on the part of the sorcerers of ancient Mexico. They called this halt seen and made it the cornerstone of their knowledge. To see energy as it flowed in the universe was, for them, an essential tool that they employed in making their classificatory schemes. Because of this capacity, for instance, they conceived the total universe available to the perception of human beings as an onion-like affair, consisting of thousands of layers. The daily world of human beings, they believed, is but one such layer. Consequently, they also believed that other layers are not only accessible to human perception, but are part of man's natural heritage. Another issue of tremendous value in the knowledge of those sorcerers, an issue which was also a consequence of their capacity to see energy as it flowed in the universe, was the discovery of the human energetic configuration. This human energetic configuration was, for them, a conglomerate of energy fields agglutinated together by a vibratory force that bound those energy fields into a luminous ball of energy. For the sorcerers of Don Juan's lineage, a human being has an oblong shape like an egg or a round shape like a ball. Thus, they called them luminous eggs or luminous balls. This sphere of luminosity was considered by them to be our true self. True in the sense that it is irreducible in terms of energy. It is irreducible because the totality of human resources are engaged in the act of perceiving it directly as energy. Those shamans discovered that on the back face of this luminous ball there is a point of greater brilliance. They figured out through processes of observing energy directly that this point is key in the act of turning energy into sensory data 
and then interpreting it. For this reason, they called it the assemblage point, and deemed that perception is indeed assembled there. They described the assemblage point as being located behind the shoulder blades, an arm's length away from them. They also found out that the assemblage point for the entire human race is located on the same spot. Thus giving every human being an entirely similar view of the world. A finding of tremendous value for them and for shamans of succeeding generations was that the location of the assemblage point on that spot is the result of usage and socialization. For this reason, they considered it to be an arbitrary position which gives merely the illusion of being final and irreducible. A product of this illusion is the seemingly unshakable conviction of human beings that the world they deal with daily is the only world that exists and that its finality is undeniable. Believe me, Don Juan said to me once, this sense of finality about the world is a mere illusion. Due to the fact that it has never been challenged, it stands as the only possible view. To see energy as it flows in the universe is the tool for challenging it. Through the use of this tool, the sorcerers of my lineage arrived at the conclusion that there are indeed a staggering number of worlds available to man's perception. They described those worlds as being all-inclusive realms, realms where one can act and struggle. In other words, they are worlds where one can live and die, as in this world of everyday life. During the 13 years of my association with him, Don Juan taught me the basic steps toward accomplishing this feat of seeing. I have discussed those steps in all of my previous writings, but never have I touched on the key point in this process, the magical passes. He taught me a great number of them, but along with that wealth of knowledge, Don Juan also left me with the certainty that I was the last link of his lineage. Accepting that I was the last link of his lineage implied automatically, for me, the task of finding new ways to disseminate the knowledge of his lineage, since its continuity was no longer an issue. I need to clarify a very important point in this regard. Don Juan Matis was not ever interested in teaching his knowledge. He was interested in perpetuating his lineage. His three other disciples and I were the means chosen, he said, by the Spirit itself, for he had no active part in it that were going to ensure that per perpetuation. Therefore, he engaged himself in a titanic effort to teach me all he knew about sorcery or shamanism and about the development of his lineage. In the course of training me, he realized that my energetic configuration was, according to him, so vastly different from his own that it couldn't mean anything else but the end of his line. I told him that I resented enormously his interpretation of whatever invisible difference existed between us. I didn't like the burden of being the last of his line 
nor did I understand his reasoning. The shamans of ancient Mexico, he said to me once, believed that choice, as human beings understand it, is the precondition of the cognitive world of man, but that it is only a benevolent interpretation of something which is found when awareness ventures beyond the cushion of, of our world. A benevolent interpretation of acquiescence. Human beings are in the throes of forces that pull them every which way. The art of sorcerers is not really to choose, but to be subtle enough to acquiesce. Sorcerers, although they seem to make nothing else but decisions, make no decisions at all, he went on. I didn't decide to choose you, and I didn't decide that you would be the way you are. Since I couldn't choose to whom I would impart my knowledge, I had to accept whomever the Spirit was offering me, and that person was you. And you are energetically capable only of ending, not of continuing. He maintained that the enduring, the ending of his line had nothing to do with him or his efforts, or with his success or failure as a sorcerer seeking total freedom. He understood it as something that had to do with the choice exercised beyond the human level, not by beings or entities, but by the impersonal force forces of the universe. Finally, I came to accept what Don Juan called my fate. Accepting it put me face to face with another issue that he referred to as looking the door, locking the door when you leave. That is to say, I assumed the responsibility of deciding exactly what to do with everything he had taught me and carrying out my decision impeccably. First of all, I asked myself the crucial question of what to do with the magical passes the facet of Don Juan's knowledge most imbued with pragmatism and function. I decided to use the magical passes and teach them to whoever wanted to learn them. My decision to end the secrecy that had surrounded them for an undetermined length of time was naturally the corollary of my total conviction that I am indeed the end of Don Juan's lineage. It became inconceivable to me that I should carry secrets which were not even mine. To shroud the magical passes in secrecy was not my decision. It was my decision, however, to end such a condition. I endeavored from then on to come up with a more generic form of each magical pass, a form suitable to everyone. This resulted in a configuration of slightly modified forms of each one of the magical passes. I have called this new configuration of movements tensegrity, a term which belongs to architecture, where it means the property of skeleton structures that employ continuous tension members and discontinuous compression members in such a way that each member operates with the maximum efficiency and economy. In order to explain what the magical passes of the sorcerers who lived in Mexico in ancient times are, I would like to make a clarification. 
ancient times meant for Don Juan. A time 10,000 years ago and beyond. A figure that seems incongruous if examined from the point of view of the classificatory schemes of modern scholars. When I confronted Don Juan with the discrepancy between his estimate and what I considered to be a more realistic one, he remained adamant in his conviction. He believed it to be a fact that people who lived in the New World 10,000 years ago were deeply concerned with matters of the universe and perception that modern man has not even begun to fathom. Regardless of our differing chronological interpretations, the effectiveness of the magical passes is undeniable to me, and I feel obliged to elucidate the subject, strictly following the manner in which it was presented to me. The directness of their effect on me has had a deep influence on the way in which I deal with them. What I am presenting in this work is an intimate reflection of that influence. Magical Passes The first time Don Juan talked to me at length about Magical Passes was when he made a derogatory comment about my weight. You are way too chubby, he said, looking at me from head to toe and shaking his head in disapproval. You are one step from being fat. Wear and tear is beginning to show in you. Like any other member of your race, you are developing a lump of fat on your neck like a bull. It's time that you take seriously one of the sorcerer's greatest findings, the magical passes. What magical passes are you talking about, Don Juan? I asked. You have never mentioned this topic to me before. Or if you have, it must have been so lightly that I can't recall anything about it. Not only have I told you a great deal about magical passes, he said, you know a great number of them already. I have been teaching them to you all along. As far as I was concerned, it wasn't true that he had taught me any magical passes all along. I protested vehemently. Don't be so passionate about defending your wonderful self, he joked, making a ridiculous gesture of apology with his eyebrows. What I meant to say is that you imitate everything I do. So, I have been cashing in on your imitation capacity. I have shown you various magical passes all along, and you have always taken them to be my delight in cracking my joints. I like the way you interpret them, cracking my joints. We are going to keep on referring to them in that manner. I have shown you ten different ways of cracking my joints, he continued. Each one of them is a magical pass that fits to perfection my body and yours. You could say that those ten magical passes are in your line and mine. They belong to us personally and individually, as they belonged to other sorcerers who were just like the two of us in the 25 generations that preceded us. The magical passes Don Juan was referring to, as he himself had said, were ways in which I thought he cracked his joints. He used to move his arms, legs, torso, and hips in specific ways. I thought, in order to create a maximum stretch, of his muscles, bones, and ligaments. The result of those stretching movements, from my point of view, 
was a succession of cracking sounds, which I always thought that he was producing for my amazement and amusement. He, indeed, had asked me time and time again to imitate him. In a challenging manner, he had even dared me to memorize the movements and repeat them at home until I could get my joints to make cracking noises, just like his. I had never succeeded in reproducing the sounds, yet I had definitely but unwittingly learned all the movements. I know now that not achieving that cracking sound was a blessing in disguise, because the muscles and tendons of the arms and back should never be stressed to that point. Don Juan was born with the facility to crack the joints of his arms and back, just as some people have the facility to crack their knuckles. How did the old sorcerers invent those magical passes, Don Juan? I asked. Nobody invented them, he said sternly. To think that they were invented implies instantly the intervention of the mind. And this is not the case when it comes to those magical passes. They were rather discovered by the old shamans. I was told that it all began with the extraordinary sensation of well-being that those shamans experienced when they were in shamanistic states of heightened awareness. They felt such tremendous enthralling vigor that they struggled to repeat it in their hours of vigil. At first, Don Juan explained to me once, those shamans believed that it was a mood of well-being that heightened awareness created in general. Soon they found out that not all the states of shamanistic heightened awareness which they entered produced in them the same sensation of well-being. A more careful scrutiny revealed to them that whenever that sensation of well-being occurred, they had always been engaged in some specific kind of bodily movement. They realized that while they were in states of heightened awareness, their bodies moved involuntarily in certain ways, and that those certain ways were indeed the cause of that unusual sensation of physical and mental plenitude. Don Juan speculated that it had always appeared to him that the movements that the bodies of those shamans executed automatically in heightened awareness were a sort of hidden heritage of mankind, something that had been put in deep storage to be revealed only to those who were looking for it. He portrayed those sorcerers as deep-sea divers, who without knowing it, reclaimed it. Don Juan said that those sorcerers arduously began to piece together some of the movements they remembered. Their efforts paid off. They were capable of recreating movements that had seemed to them to be automatic reactions of the body in a state of heightened awareness. Encouraged by their success, they were capable of recreating hundreds of movements, which they performed without ever attempting to classify them into an understandable scheme. Their idea was that in heightened awareness, the movements happened spontaneously, and that there was a force that guided their effect without the intervention of their volition. Don Juan commented that the nature of their findings always led them to believe that the sorcerers of ancient times were extraordinary people because the movements that they discovered were never revealed in the same fashion 
to modern shamans who also entered into heightened awareness. Perhaps this was because modern shamans had learned the movements beforehand in some fashion or another from their predecessors or perhaps because the sorcerers of ancient times had more energetic mass. What do you mean, Don Juan, that they had more energetic mass? I asked. Were they bigger men? I don't think they were physically any bigger, he said. But energetically, they appeared to the eye of a seer as an oblong shape. They called themselves luminous eggs. I have never seen a luminous egg in my life. All I have seen are luminous balls. It is presumable then that man has lost some energetic mass over the generations. Don Juan explained to me that to a seer, the universe is composed of an infinite number of energy fields. They appear to the eye of the seer as luminous filaments that shoot out every which way. Don Juan said that those filaments crisscross through the luminous balls that human beings are, and that it was reasonable to assume that if human beings were once oblong shapes like eggs, they were much higher than a ball. Therefore, energy fields that touched human beings at the crown of the luminous egg are no longer touching them now that they are luminous balls. Don Juan felt that this meant to him a loss of energy mass, which seemed to have been crucial for the purpose of reclaiming that hidden treasure, the magical passes. Why are the passes of the old shamans called magical passes, Don Juan? I asked him on one occasion. They are not just called magical passes, he said. They are magical. They produce an effect that cannot be accounted for by means of ordinary explanations. These movements are not physical exercises or mere postures of the body. They are real attempts at reaching an optimal state of being. The magic of the movements, he went on, is a subtle change that the practitioners experience on executing them. It is an ephem ephem ephemeral quality that the movement brings to their physical and mental states, a kind of shine, a light in the eyes. This subtle change is a touch of the spirit. It is as if the practitioners, through their movements, reestablish an unused link with the life force that sustains them. He further explained that another reason that the movements are called magical passes is that by means of practicing them, shamans are transported in terms of perception to other states of being in which they can sense the world in an indescribable manner. Because of this quality, because of this magic, Don Juan said to me, the passes must be practiced not as exercises, but as a way of beckoning power. But can they be taken as physical movements, although they have never been taken as such? I asked. You can practice them any way you wish, Don Juan replied. The magical passes enhance awareness, regardless of how you take them. The intelligent thing would be to take them as what they are, magical passes that on being practiced led the practitioner to drop the mask of socialization.
What is this mask of socialization? I asked. The veneer that all of us defend and die for, he said. The veneer we acquire in the world. The one that prevents us from reaching all our potential. The one that makes us believe we are immortal. The intent of thousands of sorcerers permeates these movements, executing them even in a casual way makes the mind come to a halt. What do you mean that they make the mind come to a halt? I asked. Everything that we do in the world, he said, we recognize and identify by converting it into lines of similarity, lines of things that are strung together by purpose. For example, if I say to you, fork, this immediately brings to your mind the idea of spoon, knife, tablecloth, napkin, plate, cup and saucer, glass of wine, chile con carne, banquet, birthday, fiesta. You could certainly go on naming things strung together by purpose nearly forever. Everything we do is strung like this. The strange part for sorcerers is that they see that all these lines of affinity, all these lines of things strung together by purpose, are associated with man's idea that things are unchangeable and forever, like the Word of God. I don't see, Don Juan, why you bring the Word of God into this elucidation. What does the word of God have to do with what you're trying to explain? Everything, he replied. It seems to be that in our minds, the entire universe is like the word of God, absolute and unchanging. This is the way we conduct ourselves. In the depths of our minds, there is a check-in device that doesn't permit us to stop to examine that the Word of God, as we accept it and believe it to be, pertains to a dead world. A live world, on the other hand, is in constant flux. It moves, it changes, it reverses itself. The most abstract reason why the magical passes of the sorcerers of my lineage are magical, he went on, is that in practicing them, the body of the practitioner realizes that everything, instead of being an unbroken chain of objects that have affinity for each other, is a current, a flux. And if everything in the universe is a flux, a current, that current can be stopped. A dam can be put on it. And in this manner, its flux can be halted or deviated. Don Juan explained to me on one occasion the overall effect that the practice of the magical passes had on the sorcerers of his lineage and correlated this effect with what would happen to modern practitioners. The sorcerers of my lineage, he said, were shocked half to death upon realizing that practicing their magical passes brought about the halt of the otherwise uninterrupted flux of things. They constructed a series of metaphors to describe this halt, and in their effort to explain it or reconsider it, they flubbed it. They lapsed into ritual and ceremony. They began to enact the act of halting the flux of things. They believed that if certain ceremonies and rituals were focused on a definite aspect 
of their magical passes, the magical passes themselves would beckon a specific result. Very soon, the number and complexity of their rituals and ceremonies became more encumbering than the number of their magical passes. It is very important, he went on, to focus the attention of the practitioner on some definite aspect of the magical passes. However, that, fixi that fixation should be light, funny, void of morbidity and grimness. It should be done for the hell of it, without really expecting returns. He gave the example of one of, one of his cohorts, a sorcerer by the name of Silvio Manuel, whose delight and predilection was to adapt the magical passes of the sorcerers of ancient times to the steps of his modern dancing. Don Juan described Silvio Manuel as a superb acrobat and dancer who actually danced the magical passes. The Nawal Elias Uloa, Don Juan continued, was the most prominent innovator of my lineage. He was the one who threw all the ritual out the window, so to speak, <clears throat> and practiced the magical passes exclusively for the purpose for which they were originally used at one time in the remote past, for the purpose of redeploying energy. The Nawal Julian Osario, who came after him, Don Juan continued, was the one who gave Ritual the final death blow. Since he was a bona fide professional actor who at one time had made his living acting in the theater, he put enormous stock into what sorcerers called the shamanistic theater. He called it the theater of infinity and into it he poured all the magical passes that were available to him. Every movement of his characters was imbued to the gills with magical passes. Not only that, but he turned the theater into a new avenue for teaching them. Between the Nawal Julian, the actor of Infinity, and Silvio Manuel, the dancer of Infinity, they had the whole thing pegged down. A new era was on the horizon. The era of pure redeployment. Don Juan's explanation of redeployment was that human beings perceived as conglomerates of energy fields, are sealed energetic units that have definite boundaries which don't permit the entrance or the exit of energy. Therefore, the energy existing within that conglomerate of energy fields is all that each human individual can count on. The natural tendency of human beings, he said, is to push energy away from the centers of vitality which are located on the right side of the body right at the edge of the rib cage on the area of the liver and gallbladder on the left side of the body again at the edge of the rib cage on the area of the pancreas and spleen on the back right behind the other two centers around the kidneys and right above them on the area of the adrenal glands at the base of the neck on the v-spot made by the sternum and clavicle and around the uterus and ovaries in women how do human beings push this energy away Don Juan I asked by worrying he replied by succumbing to the stress of everyday life. The duress of daily actions takes its toll 
on the body. And what happens to this energy, Don Juan? I asked. It gathers on the periphery of the luminous ball, he said. Sometimes to the point of making a thick, bark-like deposit. The magical passes relate to the total human being as a physical body and as a conglomerate of energy fields. They agitate the energy that has been accumulated in the luminous ball and return it to the physical body itself. The magical passes engage both the body itself as a physical entity that suffers the dispersion of energy and the body as an energetic entity which is capable of redeploying that dispersed energy. Having energy on the periphery of the luminous ball, he continued, energy that is not being redeployed is as useless as not having energy, any energy at all. It is a truly terrifying situation to have a surplus of energy stashed away, inaccessible for all practical, practical purposes. It is like being in the desert dying of dehydration while you carry a tank of water that you cannot open because you don't have any tools. In that desert, you can't even find a rock to bang it with. The true magic of the magical passes is the fact that they cause crusted down energy to enter again into the centers of vitality. Hence, the feeling of well-being and prowess, which is the practitioner's experience. The sorcerers of Don Juan's lineage, before they entered into their excessive ritualism and ceremony, had formulated the basis for this redeployment. They called it saturation, meaning that they inundated their bodies with a profusion of magical passes in order to allow the force that binds us together to guide those magical passes to cause the maximum of redeployment of energy. But Don Juan, are you telling me that every time you crack your joints or every time I try to imitate you, we are really redeploying energy? I asked him once, without really meaning to be sarcastic. Every time we execute a magical pass, he replied, we are indeed altering the basic structure of our beings. Energy, which is ordinarily crusted down, is released and begins to enter into the vortexes of vitality of the body. Only by means of that reclaimed energy can we put up a dike, a barrier to contain an otherwise uncontainable and always deleterious flow. I asked Don Juan to give me an example of putting a dam on what he was calling a deleterious flow. I told him that I wanted to visualize it in my mind. I'll give you an example, he said. For instance, at my age, I should be prey to high blood pressure. If I went to see a doctor, the doctor upon seeing me would assume that I must be an old Indian plagued with uncertainties, frustrations, and bad diet. All of this naturally resulting in a most expected and predictable condition of high blood pressure, an acceptable corollary of my age. I don't have any problems with high blood pressure, he went on. Not because I am stronger than the average man or because of my genetic frame, but because my magical passes have made my body break through 
any patterns of behavior that result in high blood pressure. I can truthfully say that every time I crack my joints following the execution of a magical pass, I am blocking off the flow of expectations and behavior that ordinarily result in high blood pressure at my age. Another example I can give you is the agility of my knees, he continued. Haven't you noticed how much more agile I am than you? When it comes to moving my knees, I'm a kid. With my magical passes, I put a dam on the current of behavior and physicality that makes the knees of people, both men and women, stiff with age. One of the most annoying feelings I had ever experienced was caused by the fact that Don Juan Matis, although he could have been my grandfather, was infinitely younger than I. In comparison, I was stiff, opinionated, repetitious. I was senile. He, on the other hand, was fresh, inventive, agile, resourceful. In short, he possessed something which, although I was young, I did not. Youth. He delighted in telling me repeatedly that young age was not youth, and that young age was in no way a deterrent to senility. He pointed out that if I watched my fellow men carefully and dispassionately, I would be able to corroborate that by the time they reached 20 years of age, they were already senile, repeating themselves inanely. How is it possible, Don Juan, I said, that you could be younger than I? I have vanquished my mind, he said, opening his eyes wide to denote bewilderment. I don't have a mind to tell me that it is time to be old, I don't honor agreements in which I didn't participate. Remember this. It is not just a slogan for sorcerers to say that they do not honor agreements in which they did not participate. To be plagued by old age is one such agreement. We were silent for a long time. Don Juan seemed to be waiting. I thought for the effect that his words might cause in me. What I thought to be my psychological unity was further ripped apart by a clearly dual response on my part. On one level, I repudiated with all my might the nonsense that Don Juan was verbalizing. On another level, however, I couldn't fail to notice how accurate his remarks were. Don Juan was old, and yet he wasn't old at all. He was ages younger than I. He was free from encumbering thoughts and habit patterns. He was roaming around in incredible worlds. He was free while I was imprisoned by heavy thought patterns and habits, by petty and futile considerations about myself, which I felt on that occasion, for the first time ever, weren't even mine. I asked Don Juan on another occasion something that had been bothering me for a long time. He had stated that the sorcerers of ancient Mexico discovered the magical passes, which were some sort of hidden treasure, placed in storage for man to find. I wanted to know who would put something like that in storage for man. The only idea that I could come up with was derived from Catholicism. I thought of God doing it, 
or a guardian angel or the Holy Spirit. It is not the Holy Spirit, he said, which is only holy to you because you're secretly a Catholic. And certainly it is not God, a benevolent father, as you understand God. Nor is it a goddess, a nurturing mother, watching over the affairs of man, as many people believe to be the case. It is rather an impersonal force that has endless things in storage for those who dare to seek them. It is a force in the universe. It is an agglutinating factor, a vibratory force that joins the conglomerate of energy fields that human beings are into one concise, cohesive unit. This vibratory force is the factor that doesn't allow the entrance or the exit of energy from the luminous ball. The sorcerers of ancient Mexico, he went on, believed that the performance of their magical passes was the only factor that prepared and led the body to the transcendental corroboration of the existence of that agglutinating force. From Don Juan's explanations, I derived the conclusion that the vibratory force he spoke about, which agglutinates our fields of energy, is apparently similar to what modern-day astronomers believe must happen at the core of all the galaxies that exist in the cosmos. They believe that there, at their cores, a force of incalculable strength holds the stars of galaxies in place. This force, called a black hole, is a theoretical construct which seems to be the most reasonable explanation as to why stars do not fly away, driven by their own rotational speeds. Don Juan said that the old sorcerers knew that human beings, taken as conglomerates of energy fields, are held together, not by energetic wrappings or energetic ligaments, but by some sort of vibration that renders everything at once alive and in place. Don Juan explained that those sorcerers, by means of their practices and their discipline, became capable of handling that vibratory force once they were fully conscious of it. Their expertise in dealing with it became so extraordinary that their actions were transformed into legends, mythological events that existed only as fables. For instance, one of the stories that Don Juan told about the ancient sorcerers was that they were capable of dissolving their physical mass by merely placing their full consciousness and intent on that force. Don Juan stated that although they were capable of actually going through a pinhole if they deemed it necessary, they were never quite satisfied with the result of this maneuver of dissolving their mass. The reason for their discontent was that once their mass was dissolved, their capacity to act vanished. They were left with the alternative of only witnessing events in which they were incapable of participating. Their ensuing frustration, the result of being incapacitated to act, turned, according to Don Juan, into their damning flaw, their obsession 
with uncovering the nature of that vibratory force. An obsession driven by their concreteness, which made them want to hold and control that force. Their fervent desire was to strike from the ghost-like condition of masslessness, something which Don Juan said could not ever be accomplished. Modern-day practitioners, cultural hires of those sorcerers of antiquity, having found out that it is not possible to be concrete and utilitarian about that vibratory force, have opted for the only rational alternative, to become conscious of that force with no other purpose in sight except the elegance and well-being brought about by knowledge. The only permissible time, Don Juan said to me once, when modern-day sorcerers use the power of this vibratory agglutinating force is when they burn from within, when the time comes for them to leave this world. It is simplicity itself for sorcerers to place their absolute and total consciousness on the binding force with the intent to burn, and off they go like a puff of air.